Yeah, let's, let's jump on the hype train, all right? Let's talk about the GPT. We've been playing with this stuff for a few months now. It, it keeps being delightful. So I asked it yesterday to generate a, a Ruby program that in turn generates a rap song about a Yukihiro Matsumoto. And it, uh, so there is interaction there, and it still does it. It's, um, it, it keeps striking me as uh, it's still unexpected after these months. And I wouldn't know about the, the metric of the rap. Uh, maybe that's not the best, but the rhymes. I mean, rhyming needle with Matsumoto, that's, that's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> And you will also notice that I always ask, uh, say please, when I ask stuff to GPT, because the idea is that when it eventually takes over, I hope it remembers and uh, it, it will kill me last. So, so let's try to wrap our mind around GPT and at a high level, how it works. And I will do that in five chapters. I will start from scratch. So if anybody who has experience with neural networks, please bear with me. I want everybody to be on board, okay? And a short disclaimer, we don't really know how GPT-4 works because OpenAI won't tell us. But uh, we can assume it works kind of like GPT-3. That works like most large language models. We have no, uh, no hint that OpenAI has any secret recipe going on. Their models are just big. They are good at executing, but otherwise, it's just neural networks. Neural networks, chapter one. Instead of showing you the usual diagram with bubbles, uh, how do neural networks work starting with a concrete example, if a toy example? Let's say that we have uh, a small music label, an indie label. We want to predict how popular our songs will be based on a number of things. For example, BPM, okay, beats per minute. Let's say that we have beats per minute there and the number of streams in uh, the last couple of weeks on the other axis, okay? And we have a history, and we can put this history here on the chart. Every dot is a, a track that we release, and this is how we did so far. It looks like our audience is into chill out music around 100 BPM, and down there, there is a, a, an area of very unsuccessful songs, and then it picks up again around, uh, I would say, 185 what is drum and bass so it, it's good gives you a rough idea but it's not very good for predicting the future it gets better if we take these points and we approximate them with a continuous function like this i traced it by hand it's a bit approximated that's what it is but once we have this we're in a better shape because we can forget about the data just to use the function, right? So our latest track has, let's say, 175 BPM. How can we expect it to do? The function will tell us. But of course, you cannot predict how successful a song will be based on BPM alone. So we want more data. We want more uh, input variables. For example, maybe the week of the year that the song was released, that might have an effect. Maybe, I don't know, people listen to, to high BPM songs more in summer, I don't know. So we can put that on the chart as well. So now we have BPM and the week of the year and the number of streams. And now the function is not a two-dimensional function anymore. Now it's in three dimensions and it's not a line anymore. Now it's a surface, but same thing, right? And we can keep adding dimensions. If we had one more, we cannot 
draw a web picture anymore. We can only see three dimensions, but it's okay. I mean, the function is still there. We can add, I don't know, the genre, for example. If we can find a way to express it as a number, uh, I don't know, and enumerate it, then it's fine. Uh, we can still have the function, and the function can still predict the future. That's, in general, with any number of inputs, what neural networks do. That's a neural network. It's a function in a box. It's a function in a box. Okay. Now we'll talk about how we can come up with the function, but once you have it, you can just carry your little function box around and give it the input, it will come up with an output. So that's the first fact that I wanted to share. Neural networks approximate functions. That's their job. How do they do that? For example, um, let's say that you want to solve a real problem with a neural network. Let's go for the, for the classic machine learning problem. You want to recognize pictures of, cat, of cats. How do you do that? How, what are your inputs then? Knowing what we know about functions. What do you give the neural network? To restate the problem, you have pictures, right? Like that picture there, that's a cat. You want, you want it to say, yeah, it's a cat. But this guy here, this guy, he's fake. So, no, not a cat. Okay. One way you can do that is uh, just by taking the image, breaking it down into pixels, and each pixel can be an input variable. Or you can break down the pixels into their RGB values. And then it's uh, three input variables per pixel. And you want a Boolean result. And when people want a Boolean result out of a neural network, what they do usually is to ask for a number from 0 to 1 that expresses how sure the network is that the answer is true. So, for example, it would say 0 0.9, probably a cat. Or, uh, nope, totally not a cat. So, you can take a problem and cast it in terms of a neural network like that. Uh, by the way, the implication of this is astounding to me. I, I mean, maybe I'm easily surprised, but this means that there is a function somewhere that takes the pixels in an image, and imagine this surface in a very highly dimensional space, right? But it's there, and it has a peak if the image contains a cat. So it's a, we cannot visualize it, but if we could visualize multiple dimensions, it's literally there. We could see the surface. It's the cat's surface. It's, uh, it's quite amazing if you think about it. How does that happen inside the box? If you open the box, what's going on inside the box? Well, inside the neural network, uh, you have layers. And those layers are essentially matrices. They, are, they can be two dimensions, three dimensions. Uh, it's, uh, it depends on the circumstances, but it's big matrices of numbers. And in between the matrices, there are these operations that are surprisingly simple usually. Usually it's a matrix multiplication. That is, if you don't know, it's a bunch of multiplications and sums. It can be slightly more complex operations, like sometimes you rescale a matrix, you average the numbers. Sometimes uh, you have uh, uh, some operations that are, for example, about clipping the matrix. So every number that is negative becomes zero. But it's simple stuff like that. And if you have enough of these and enough numbers in there, you can approximate any function. And which function you approximate exactly depends on the numbers inside the matrices, right? Those are called the parameters of the neural network. So what's the trick? It's finding the parameters that approximate the function that you want to have. How do you find the parameters? That's a stage that's called the training the neural network. And here comes 
training in two minutes. How does it work? Well, essentially, the idea of training is that you initialize the network with the random numbers, and you get a random function. And then you find a way to express as a number how bad the function is, how much of an error it has compared to what you want to have. So for example, if you have those numbers, those little song dots, you can compare them to the function and say, well, this is pretty bad. The error is still high. And then you have an algorithm that goes into the numbers and changes the numbers to make the error only a little bit smaller, to make the function only a little bit closer to what it's supposed to be. And then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it like hundreds of thousands or millions of times until you have an error that is low enough that you say, OK, I can live with this. I will keep this error. And you get your function in a box. The algorithm that does this is uh, arguably the most important algorithm in artificial intelligence. It's called the backpropagation or backprop for friends. It's called like that because uh, it starts from the end. That's the way it works. It starts from the last layer in the network. And it says, how can I tweak the numbers to make the error a little bit smaller? And then it says, OK, let's move on to the next, to the previous layer, next to last. And how can I change those numbers to get these numbers in the next layer to do what I want? And so on, it, it goes back to the beginning. So essentially, a lot of backpropagation, a lot of error reduction, you get your function in a box. Two things I want to tell you before leaving neural networks behind. One is, these operations in the network, they are essentially, they define the architecture of this thing. If you change the operations, you get a different network. And the way you choose the operations depends on the data that you want to deal with. So in this case, for example, we're dealing with pictures. We want operations that are good for some measure good at dealing with pictures. So for example, you don't want to squash the pixels into one long line, because otherwise you lose the geometry. And a lot of operations do that. Instead, uh, for example, there are operations called convolutions. They are not particularly complicated. There are mathematical operations on matrices that safeguard the geometry of the thing, because you know that you're dealing with something that is square. And that's one thing that I wanted to tell you. So those operations are relevant, and we need to know when we design the network what we're dealing with, if we want it to be effective. I mean, in theory, any network can do anything. But if you want to train it feasibly in a time that is reasonable, then you need to care about this stuff. Another thing that I wanted to tell you is why do neural networks have a lot of layers? And we found out at some point that the deeper you get, the more layers you add, the better the network. And the reason for this is another slightly mind-boggling fact. That is, at some point, people started to wonder, what, what is it that they are doing these layers? And it's hard to look inside the layers and understand all those numbers. We cannot wrap our mind around it. Uh, so they came up with smart ways to check what each layer was getting excited about. And what they found is that, for example, if you're dealing with uh, images, the first layer of the network is essentially recognizing very simple shapes, like lines, vertical lines, bands, stuff like that. The second layer is uh, recognizing more complex shapes, curves or circles. And then as you get deeper into the network, you start seeing things like objects emerging. So essentially, these things are abstraction machines. They are creating abstraction, and that's astounding because well you know like 15 years ago we thought that yeah you can use a neural network to recognize pictures but you've got to help it 
you got to tell it what to look for. You got to say, hey, look for edges. You know, look for areas with high contrast, I don't know. And that was called the feature engineering because we were taking the picture and extracting the features that we thought, we, we thought were important. But then we find out that neural networks, if uh, they are deep enough, they don't need us. They don't need us to, to, tell us, uh, to tell them which features to look for. They will find their own features, which was quite a breakthrough. So, neural networks. Let's see it about neural network. Let's talk about stanciness for a moment. Because we want to talk about GPT ultimately, about language. So let's talk about a technique that's good at dealing with language. I have a slot for you. So there is this nice person here, and I want to put uh, him or her in a, on a on a chart uh, that measures how cute this thing is, and also how quick, how fast it is. So I don't know about you. I, it's a judgment call. I think it's pretty cute, but it's probably slow, so it would go around there, right? That's where the word slot sits in my word if I do this exercise. Um, an airplane is essentially, un unless you have a very specific fetish for airplanes, it's not super cute, but, but it's fast, right? It goes there. Um, and then I came up with um, a swallow, a very, very nice bird. And uh, it occurred to me, because I was uh, driving just the other day, uh, I was maybe 40 kilometers per hour, and uh, this swallow decided to, to cross the street. And she didn't bother to, you know, fly high. She just passed under my car, and I was like, <laughs> shit. She, she passed in between, in between the axes. It, they are super fast, super nimble birds. So I was like, wow, you might not be quite as cute as a slot, but man, you're fast. So I would put it there. So we are starting to organize words into this space, right? And we can add dimensions to this space. For example, how alive something is, right? If we add this dimension, then, you know, the slot and the swallow come closer here along this axis. Uh, it's a uh, it's getting a little bit hard to read, but you catch my drift. And now we are starting to have a three-dimensional space where wars are organized, and the place where they are are coordinates, right? So for example, the swallow has uh, high coordinates for th these three dimensions, close to one, let's say it goes from zero to one, for example, close to one, while the airplane uh, has a very low uh, aliveness and low cuteness. So we're organizing words in this space. And we can keep adding dimensions. So ultimately, we come up with very long vectors that describe words. This is an idea called word embeddings. So keep it in mind. I'm going to switch to a slightly different topic for a moment. But keep this idea, word embeddings, in mind. Essentially that words can be expressed as arrays, and this array is the meaning of the word. It's a powerful idea. Now, let's take some text. This is Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species. And imagine doing this exercise with a neural network that you built. And we want the neural network to do this. Let's take words in pairs, for example, sequences of words. Let's say a sequence of two words. And let's mask the last word. And now let's ask the neural network to guess that word. We give it the first one. We ask it to guess the second one. Okay. 
there is a lot of training material here for free, essentially, because now we can slide this window and we get a lot of examples. We don't need to actually release a song, you know, to get a little dot on that chart. We can just take a lot of text and slide the window over it. So the, this neural network has this task. Um, you give it a word, like briefly, that was a word in the text from Darwin, and you say, next word, come on. And you train it on a lot of stuff. How, how good would you expect the network to get at guessing the next word? Hmm? Not really, no, not much. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult problem, hey? It's going to sweat it. Because uh, I mean, how many words can you have that follow the word briefly? Uh, and uh, you have a vocabulary that is all the known words in English or all the known words in every written human language. It, it can be done. But still, there are just too many possibilities. So, so the network will try because that, uh, that is what neural networks do. And it will say briefly, slot. And you are like, no, it was considered. So yeah, the neural network still sucks, even after a lot of training like that. But now here is an idea. And listen up, because this is a really brilliant idea. Okay, Take a Maddox. And this is a, a bunch of embeddings. So you have one line for each word in the vocabulary, for example, slot. And you have one column for each embedding dimension. Can be 30, can be, I, I think that modern uh, large language models use like 1000. It can be a lot of dimensions. So you have all these words with their embeddings, okay? And you take this word, but nobody has time to come up with even the embeddings, uh, let alone actually classifying all the words. So just initialize it randomly, it doesn't matter. Fill it with random numbers. And now this is the good idea. You have this embedding matrix. Take it, put it in a neural network, put it at the beginning of a neural network. So you have, for example, that thing we were doing, here is one word, predict the next word. You have a neural network that takes one word, then there is the embedding. So the word gets, uh, you do a lookup, right? You turn the word into a vector, and then you pass it to the neural network, and then you ask it to predict. But here is the twist. When you do backpropagation, you do backpropagation, for example, you have the word B, okay? And uh, you ask the neural network to make predictions. But when you do backpropagations, you do it across the entire thing. So essentially, the matrix is part of the neural network. So in this case, we have the word B, and the network is coming up with ideas about what could follow this word with, you know, probabilities. That's something that neural networks usually do. Uh, it might be this, it might be that. They all add up to one, and it, it, this table contains all, all the words in the vocabulary. And you keep training it, right? What would you expect to happen? eventually. You train it for a long time. I mean, we said the neural network doesn't get very good at this. It still sucks, because simply there is no way to predict which word might follow the word B. There is a way to make statistics on it, all right? So it can say, yeah, B good is a pretty common combination compared to, you know, be slot. But that's not what we want. That's not our goal. Our goal is the matrix. Because after a while, the matrix is full of numbers that make a little bit more sense now. What you expect, for example, is that two words that are used in similar context would have similar vectors, right? Because if the neural network wants to have something here that makes any sense, and you say, for example, I would sure like to, to eat N. 
what follows must be food. It's most likely food. But if we want to assign a high probability to all the food stuff, that means that all the food stuff must have similar number, ultimately, right? It needs to have something similar. I, I want to show you. Sorry. So these are word embeddings calculated with an algorithm that's called the GLOW. And I just downloaded them from the internet. In this case, they are pre-trained. So somebody else generated this matrix and then put it on the internet. And every line is, um, oh, boom. <laughs> every line here starts with a word that seem to be pretty much in, uh, in order of frequency, right? So these are the frequent words. And there follow, uh, I think, 50, in this case, it's uh, GLOW 50, right? It's 50 numbers from minus 2 to 2, because that's how they set it up. And these numbers are the embeddings of those words. And there are, I think, 400,000 words in here. So it starts with very common words, and towards the end, it gets to stuff that you are unlikely to ever see, even if you read through a lot of text. Okay? So it's a lot of information, right? And you look at these numbers, and it's very hard to make sense of them. So somebody did it for us. There is this page. Boom. There is this page that I found on the internet that took word embeddings uh, with 300 dimensions. And sorry, now I have to move. And there are these words here. Man, woman, boy, girl, king, queen. Just a bunch of words that the author of this page wanted to select to prove their point. And they turned the numbers into colors because that makes them way more readable. And if you look at this, you will see pattern. So for example, you see this last part. In king and queen, these last few bars are a different color. It seems that somehow these features that have been selected by the neural network, but they seem to encode the royalty. And if you look at the gender stuff, man, boy, king, they have something different, some bars that are different from queen, woman, girl. Look closely, you will see them. Those seem to encode the gender. And also there is something in boy and girl uh, I could see it this morning, it's uh, here. That's, uh, that's probably some encoding for age. And it found it by itself. You remember what I told you? They find their own features, they don't need us. And uh, here we have uh, a nice space where a few words were selected and put on, um, on a 3D space and one thing that you can see, and then it's been, th this is a 300 dimensional space, right? But you can project stuff into a 3D space if you pick your axis. And in this case, they picked axes that are age and gender here. So they projected this stuff. And if you look closely, you will see the relative position of man, king, queen, and woman. You see that there are pretty well arranged. I mean, we can actually make the classic experiment. Sorry, I'm stretching my neck a bit here. Um, let me do one thing. I, I just think I'll, um, I'll change. Uh, I'll change my display settings. Ah, good. Uh, 
I'll manage to eventually see where uh, do you see folks where the displays are because uh, I am just there boom and where is mirroring up that's fucking teamwork Okay, now let's, uh, let's play with this a little bit, right? Because uh, if these are vectors and they are in space, we should be able to do some vector arithmetic on them. So, for example, there is already a suggestion here that we do king minus man plus woman. Boom, queen. This thing works. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. For example, uh, human hand minus hand plus, no, yeah, plus dog. Canning, nah. Maybe person minus hand plus dog. Oh no, that's why. Stupid me. So it's persus, person minus dog plus pa personage, no, it's not working. But uh, I, I would have expected uh, with the first one to get a pa. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on, the, you know, uh, we make a lot of assumptions on text, and those assumptions are implicit, and they are not always right. But by the way, it's quite impressive what these things do. So, that leads us to another interesting fact, that when GPT comes up with a lot of nice words, it knows nothing about those, actually, about their meaning. It just knows uh, which words are in which relationship to which other words in this big meaning space. I mean, you talk about a king. It doesn't know what's a king. It knows it, it's something right there with this distance from a queen and that distance from a man. That's what it knows. I mean, the latest versions are apparently multimodal, so they're starting to train it on words, text, and images. But up to GPT-3, at least, you don't have multimodality. So essentially, nobody explained it, what things actually are. You just give it a lot of text. A lot of text. I did a back of the napkin calculation and it was like, you know, you, you print out all that text, you can stack it up to the stratosphere in book, regular book size. But that's all it gets, a lot of text. So, okay, let's move on. Chapter four. Are you still, uh, I is this cool? Pretty cool, thank you. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about another thing, because so far we have wars, but the, the hard part about wars is not the wars, it's the sentences, because sentences can, can be a mess, right? This is a complicated sentence that we can all read without a flinch, and it can make most AI systems cry, at least until a few years ago, because there is so much implicit knowledge in it, you can ask so many things about this stuff. So for example, you can have a question like, uh, you can apply to every word the question, what did this thing do in this scenario, in, uh, in the meaning of this sentence? And for many of these words, this question has no meaning, and no meaningful answer. But for example, if you take the dog, the answer is in there. You need to know what to be mindful of. You need to know where to put your attention, right? For example, what the dog did is uh, he ha ate her couch, right? And what did Annie do? If you had to rate the words in this sentence for how much attention they deserve to answer this question, that would be probably, yeah, she left the dog alone. These are probably the most important words. 
Arguably, there are other words that also deserve attention that are slightly less important. And that's only one question you can ask. You can ask many more, like, uh, how did this thing feel? And again, for many of these words, that question doesn't mean anything. But if you ask, how the dog felt, you should pay attention to this word, right? So, a lot of questions you can ask. And you remember what I told you earlier on, that you need to build a neural network with a shape and a structure that is based on the data you want to process. And for this kind of processing, people came up with a design where they have three matrices that they call the query, the key, and the value. And these matrices intuitively match the idea of the query is asking a question. It's the question, how does this thing feel? Or any other question. And the key and the value uh, tell you how much, the key tells you how much each other word is relevant to the question, how much attention you should pay to it. And the value comes up with values for that that you can manipulate neural network style. But really, now this sounds uh, awfully abstract, and the reason why it's that, as usual, we don't know. They don't need us, right? The, the neural network will come up with features that make sense. We're just providing the scaffolding. And these matrices are the scaffolding for the neural network to analyze a sentence. So you can put them together into something called an attention head that essentially says, we have this sentence, uh, what should I pay attention to inside the sentence? And the attention head is connected to a question. I came up with the question, how does this thing feel? What does this thing do? But the question is known to the neural network, not to us. So it can be a very abstract question that's hard to identify. So we need to ask a lot of them so we can have a lot of attention heads. And these put together, they, if we get a lot of them in a sequence, we get this, right? The abstraction thing. Only now it's abstraction language. So what is happening there is that I have a sentence, and the neural network is finding ways that the words are related to. And that the first layer, maybe it's finding ways that the words are related to at a very syntactical level. Like, uh, oh yeah, this is the subject, this is the verb. Or this is an article, and this is what the article is for. And what happens at the next level of abstraction? I don't know. I didn't read any study of people trying to understand it. I'm pretty sure people are trying to understand that, but I don't know. I, it would be great to know. For now, we can just say, let's have a lot of these attention heads. Each is a layer. Let's a lot of layers, one after the other, and feed them sentences. Now, if we take these and we put them together, and we have a structure like this, look, we have text, okay? Then we have a neural network that is a matrix of word embeddings. So the text is immediately broken down into words or tokens and converted to embeddings. And then it's passed through a bunch of attention layers. And then on top of that, you put a regular neural network, uh, just a few, because why not? Mm? You want to approximate functions. The more, the better. And there, is, uh, there are a few more things that you have to take into account. For example, I didn't draw it, but you have to take into account uh, the order of words, stuff like that. But this is the basic understanding of it. This is called GPT. Now you need a problem that it needs to solve, right? You need some way to calculate an error. Otherwise, you cannot train it. So here is one way to calculate an error. You take text and you ask it to predict the next word, only instead of a very small piece of text, like one or two words, so you can have pretty large pieces of text. 
So it has a lot to, you know, to sink its teeth into, to apply attention to. What are the important parts here? It can look all over. We don't know where, but uh, you know statistics. You've got to love it. The important thing is that at the end, it tries to generate a word. So you have all this, and in the end, it tries to predict the next word. And now you train it on a crap load of text, a lot of text, with a lot of money spending a lot of computing power. Microsoft money. Uh, in the end, you get a machine that, giving a text, predicts the next word, right? And that's all it does. It's a machine that, given a text, comes up with the next word. And then, it takes all the text, including the word it just generated, and it comes up with the next word. The robots are coming. <laughs> They're coming for us. <laughs> How much time do I have? More than enough. I will try. There is one last step. Because uh, you, you maybe thought, OK, so this is uh, a thing that uh, continues text, right? But that's not what it does, right? I mean, if I insert text, and this is uh, a known piece of text that is very specific, it's Romeo and Juliet, because we are in Verona, you know, so I get up to a point. And I say, I just leave it there. And then chat GPT will go. And then, yes, it's continued text. But the way we use it normally is that we have a conversation. That's not just continued text. You do not expect it that when you ask a question, it will answer with another question, for example. It will continue your line of questioning. No, you want an answer. So how come it doesn't look like it's just continued text? And this is a problem that's called alignment, which means, in general, we want to have an artificial intelligence that is aligned with our expectations. I don't expect that you will keep adding text. I, I want an answer to my question now. And it's uh, essentially the same problem on a large scale that you have when you want to have a machine that is unbiased, for example, non-toxic. This is a very popular conversation that a user had with Microsoft Bing that is based on GPT, where Bing started threatening the user, like, uh, okay, yeah, I'm going to dox you, I'm going to screw up your life. You don't want that to happen, right? So uh, how can you do that? How do you align a language model? There is this thing called the reinforcement learning for human feedback that essentially means OK, you train the model. Now take the model and ask it to generate uh, text based on your prompts, and then have a human rate the prompts. So the error in this case is given by a human that says uh, good prompt, bad prompt. Or another neural network trained by humans to do that. But the idea is that you just have prompts like this. You have a database of prompts. And, for example, in this case, what is the purpose of the list C in the code below? And there is one answer that is uh, true, but not super useful. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it stores all these values. Yeah, big deal. That's not what I want to hear, jerk. But there is another answer here that is much better. So humans rate those, right? It's, uh, it's funny, because uh, sometimes... Uh, uh, some of the, the questions are also trick questions. Uh, it's pretty easy to trick. Like, what, uh, in this case, they easily convinced it that it's good to eat socks after meditating. So the, the bad answer is really bad, but the good answer is still assuming that indeed socks are good for you. But 
no matter what, you have a few of these, and you essentially redirect the, the AI towards where you want to go. That leads us to yet another astounding fact. It doesn't take much to do that. I mean, they call this the training, and uh, what I call the training, they call the pre-training, but matter of fact, it's almost all pre-training, right? And then you just take a few people and you ask them to rate the answers. And it, uh, the language model learns really quickly. Because in general, there is this property of neural networks that you can train them on something. And once they learn to do that, you can repurpose them real quick. That's another astounding fact. So. That's how it works. You have this system that does word embeddings. It pays attention to the right structures of a sentence. And by doing that, it learns to predict the next word. And then it goes through a stage of fine-tuning fine with people telling it, yeah, stop doing that. Instead, do this other thing. And they repurpose it to become, for example, a conversation bot. It's essentially a stochastic parrot, as they said. Right? It repeats shit based on a probability distribution. So it's stochastic. And, and like you, I probably I can't believe this it, because you use it and it's so good and you're like how is it possible that it's just you know what we're seeing that it doesn't know what it's going to say until it literally says it and if it generates you know that, that, that it doesn't understand what it's saying I mean it literally does not right then uh, you, you ask it questions that are difficult for a human. This is a logical game, like I have four oranges, I think, yeah, in a bowl, and I want to give them to four different people, but I want one orange to stay in the bowl. And uh, a GPT is like, yep, you give three oranges to the first three people, and the fourth people gets the orange and the bowl. And I'm like, seriously? And you did this without knowing what you were seeing? Like, when you s wrote the word Z, you didn't know that you were following up with the word solution. It's that unknowing, and it still solved the riddle. So how does it happen? These are things that are called emergent abilities. The idea of emergent abilities is that there are a lot of things that a neural network like this a uh, language model can do, that just happen. Nobody trained it on them, but just by reading through a lot of text, once it reaches a certain size, suddenly it becomes able to do stuff like arithmetic. And there is a lot of debate about this, but uh, and there is a lot of study. This is a work cloud of multiple abilities that the language model develops once it reaches a certain size, and it's scaled by the size of the model. So at some point, it, uh, it becomes able to do, you know, uh, biology. At some point, it becomes able to write code. And the thing is, uh, nobody really knows yet how this happens, or, or even whether it's true. Because maybe they're not really merchant abilities. Maybe they happen slowly, but we fail to notice because that's how our brain works. But it makes you wonder. It makes you ask a lot of questions, right? I mean, it was never designed to do this stuff. But it does anyway. Because language. So the question... the most important question, I would say, what is it that we're building, really? Because, you know, what 
you have to wonder what's the next emergent ability and when is it going to happen? And of course, there are all the you know, philosophical things like, why does it think like me? Am I a stochastic parrot? And I'm very, very, very glad that <laughs> I don't have to answer those. Uh, nobody knows. I'm here just to explain how GPT works. That's, that's it. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. This was great. Thank this you. was great. <laughs> and as you said yesterday, we are fucked. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. We, we don't know what this thing is doing. And, <laughs> you know, like. We'll <laughs> find out. Yes, we'll <laughs> find out. For better or for worse, we'll find out. Guys, sorry about the noise. We're gonna we're gonna try to fix that. Um, let's see what happens. <laughs> um, but thank you for your patience. Um, we have uh, ten minutes for question and answers. Anyone with a question? Otherwise, I do have a question. Uh, let's see. Let's we'll wait see. Wait long enough. Yeah. It's like in one on ones. Just wait long enough. Someone is going to speak up. Remember the feedback. Ah. Take care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. There it is. Wait, wait, wait. Cool. Yep. Hi. So thank you for your talk. It was very thank nice you. and interesting. Uh, you mentioned that well, maybe it's a bit too much of a philosophical question again, but at some point you said, well, it says the word king, but it doesn't really know what it is. Well, how does it differ? Uh, how is it different from us? Right? I mean, we just know it in a set of contexts. So, yes, yeah, so maybe we are also st stochastic pirates. <laughs> I know that... Uh, so. We are very multimodal, right? We learn stuff in different ways. So we, we look at pictures of a king. We dress up as a king. We listen to people uh, acting, playing a king. We see kings. So we, we have uh, a lot of inputs. And as a consequence, we can uh, put our things, our uh, action back into the world along all these axes. I could go and shoot the king. I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> and uh, I can do that because I do realize that it has that place as a, you know, uh, as a, real, um, a real entity in the world. While GPT does not, because all it knows is a word and its connection to all the words. But now there are uh, a few important personalities in machine learning, like Jan LeCun, who created the first convolutional neural network back in the 90s, and is now working for Meta, uh, who are insisting that we must train uh, these uh, neural networks uh, in a multimodal fashion. So they will learn more and be closer to what we know, and then you give it a gun, you know, and it might shoot the king. But we are far from that. And right now, what we have are large language models that have this kind of very niche, very narrow knowledge. Did I pick up your train of thought? Okay, uh, I have a question from the online audience, a question from Alessia. Given how it works, um, what do you think are the most useful ways to use it in software development? Ah, uh, we are all experimenting with that, Alessia. Uh, uh, I, right, I didn't use for software development yet. I would definitely start by rubber ducking it. You know, you have a problem, you need somebody to explain the problem, who, ca who will uh, essentially lead you to the solution by asking more questions. I'm pretty sure it's great for rubber duck. And uh, I would definitely try to use it for test-driven development. You know, I write a test just, you know, 
write the code that makes it green. All that stuff is stuff that we are, uh, most of us are trying, but I don't know because I didn't write much code lately, but I did write prose and I used it as an editor. And I find that the best way to, to use it in that case is uh, as this floating little editor on my shoulder. So I can always ask questions like, do you have a better word for that? Uh, how do you say, uh, I have this ex uh, idiom in Italian that I don't quite know how it works in English. Uh, do you have an equivalent? And I would guess that, you know, for programming, I would use it the same way. It's uh, not a ready-made solution, like some managers seem to think. Uh, we can fire programmers, finally, after all these years, uh, we can just uh, use the GPT. Yeah, good luck with that. I mean, the one thing, uh, you remember when Cucumber came out, the, the testing framework, that everybody was like, oh, now we, you know, the, the domain experts can write their own Cucumber uh, specs, and then, uh, you know, there is a, s a little bit of coding to translate them, and they will uh, just write this stuff, and they didn't, because writing that stuff assumes that you can think like a programmer. So in that case, uh, all they had to do was explain to a machine, in that the machine was us, uh, uh, what to do, and they still couldn't do it because they're not, they don't think like that. So even if you replace those programmers with GPT, you still need a programmer to tell GPT what to do in a programmer speak. So I, uh, we're, I don't think we are losing our job anytime soon. Um, that's, uh, and then I don't know. Thank you. You're welcome. Great talk, by the way. Uh, so uh, the part about Cucumber actually bridges to the question that I had. Um, in my observation, we have the most hype-driven industry in the world. Like 25 years ago, everybody wanted Java applications. Like they were brilliant. Uh, after at uh, some point, uh, everybody wanted to do web applications, ideally Ruby on Rails. Afterwards, social was the buzzword. If it's social, it's amazing. Like uh, think uh, Facebook, Twitter, and everybody who tried to emulate this. Then everything had to be on the blockchain. <laughs> like uh, I remember every company was advertising, we are doing something with blockchain. We are amazing. And now I feel that this is potentially the next cycle. And it's already here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you think that this is going to have staying power and be actually game changing or? I think that the tool is a game changer. No doubt about it. This is here to stay and it's a game changer. But the way they, that most of us are envisioning the change, that's probably going to sound very naive and very quaint in just a few, a few months, years maybe. Because, I, okay, uh, story, uh, I, I cannot predict, I, I'm good at a lot of stuff and I'm very good at predicting stuff, just not the future. So don't ask me <laughs> to do that, right? Uh, but uh, what I can say is uh, I see people who are saying, hey, this is the new way to build applications. You don't have to actually build an application. You just tell GPT what you want. You have a prompt and that's the new way of coding, and boom, instant application. So the example I saw was, uh, this is a, um, um, a booking system for a restaurant, uh, an ordering system for a pizzeria, and uh, you can order your pizza, and it's just this prompt. You know, you give, uh, they gave the prompt to uh, GPT and uh, the menu, and then you could talk to it and say, hey, I want, you know, quattro stagioni pizza with uh, double mozzarella. And it was like, yeah, sure, it's 20 years. So I started playing with it. And I started, uh, that's not nice, but it's, uh, come on, it's not a person yet. So I started abusing it a little, right? So I, I was like, okay, uh, what, what do you have for toppings? Oh, I have Canadian bacon for uh, five years. I, uh, but I don't speak Canadian. I cannot have that. Can, uh, can you give me regular bacon? that was not on the menu, and uh, it's eager to please. So it was like, yeah, you can have uh, regular bacon, yeah, sure. 
but that's going to cost less than Canadian bacon, all right? And it was like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's uh, just two dollars. And then I went on like that. Is the pizza Canadian? And uh, I, in the end, I, I brought my pizza away for like uh, three euros. So I was like, I cannot wait for people to actually use this stuff in production, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be a riot. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know when exactly it gets mature enough for this. It's not right now. It's, uh, people are grossly overestimating its abilities. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.